There are no shortage of criticisms within forestry, both between the field and the public and within the field itself. But the question remains, what exactly makes forestry good or bad? It is kind of an unanswerable question, but if you look at the comment section of some of my videos, or maybe if you get some materials from your extension office, or even read some of the PR releases from some large timber companies themselves, you're gonna get some pretty standard responses. They're probably going to include something about retaining large trees, retaining a forest diversity and forest structure, maybe leaving some snags and deadwood for ecological habitat, and of course, uh, something about protecting streams and water quality, which in most places is just following the law. Or you might get a super basic response, like selective harvesting is good and clear cutting is bad. And let's not forget, anything that's not a monoculture is good forestry. Now aside from talking about the nuances of silvicultural prescriptions, of course, I almost never talk about these things. I never really talk about uh, retaining snags or you know, leaving some deadwood on the ground for ecological uh, value. I never really talk about those things, and there's a reason for that. It's not that I don't think those things are important, because they are important, but I truly don't think they're that meaningful. Now I know that's controversial for a lot of people, so before you get upset with me, just hear me out, because you might end up agreeing with me once I'm done here. So to explain myself here, I want to create some new categories and differentiate between what I would call microforestry and macroforestry. So in economics, microeconomics is the economics within a single firm, and uh, macroeconomics is, you know, economics. It's what we think of as the, as the entire economy. In forestry, I would define microforestry as the forestry within a single harvest, and macroforestry as uh, the forestry concerning an entire land base, managing an entire forest as a resource across multiple harvests. The vast majority of the things people identify as good forestry only concern microforestry. They're almost always about the forestry within a single harvest. Almost nobody talks about the macro level of forestry. What makes forestry good in aggregate? If you take care of the macroforestry, the microforestry probably isn't going to matter. If you neglect the macroforestry, it doesn't matter how good the microforestry is, it's not going to be good. To use another analogy, in nutrition we have macronutrients and micronutrients. Micronutrients are things like vitamins and minerals. Macronutrients are, uh, what are they? Fat, protein, and carbohydrates. Now is vitamin C important? Absolutely. but. How many people do you see in the year 2025 in the United States of America walking around with scurvy? Not very many. That's because as long as your overall diet is decent, you're probably getting enough of those things. And if you do have a deficiency, it's going to be pretty easy to take care of. You could be eating nothing but McDonald's and gas station food, but as long as you got, I don't know, one orange juice a week with your McDonald's breakfast, you're probably covered. The vast majority of people in forestry or interested in forestry, stakeholders if you want to use LinkedIn speak, the vast majority of them just talk about vitamin C. So I kind of want to demystify this whole issue and get people to think in terms of good macro forestry. So what I want to do is kind of take you through different macro forestry regimes and you can make the judgment for yourself what good forestry looks like. And of course, ultimately, I'll give you my opinion, which I think can be distilled into one single metric, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, let's look at the forest. All right, so I'm going to be looking at some aerial imagery here, and uh, right now I have the new silvicultural uh, canopy height model open. So this is actually showing us, um, based on some training with LiDAR data and also NAEP imagery, what the estimated height of the forest canopy is. So this is basically showing us timber size. Yellow is big trees, blue is small trees, and then the uh, kind of reddish openings here are no trees. So I'm going to start out with kind of the gold standard here. Uh, this is the Baxter State Park, so we're in Maine. This is the Baxter State Park Scientific Forest Management Area. And this is a pretty cool part of Baxter State Park where they do a lot of, um, I would call it experimental forestry. They have a stated mission of being an example of what forestry can be and um, it's a really cool place and hopefully I'll be able to visit this in the next few weeks here. But um, what we can see is a pretty big diversity in harvest types. You have 
some heavier, maybe overstory removals right here. Um, you have some patches being created down here and uh, maybe your classic partial harvester selection harvesting down in here. So from a microforestry perspective, again, uh, the forestry within single harvests, all the elements of good forestry are here. We have some really good buffers on the water bodies. We have good structural diversity. Uh, I'm sure good species diversity and so forth. We also have a good diversity in the types of harvest, which gives us you know, different types of forests. So that's good to see too. But what I really want you to pay attention to here is the overall picture. What do we see about this forest management regime? <laughs> it's not super aggressive. Um, the vast majority of the forest retains more of a natural or naturalistic structure. It looks fairly untouched. So we have a large percent of the overall forest that is mature or in a mature stage. So because the SFMA is public land, the forest management plans are also public. So we know a lot about this land base. And uh, from what I can gather, it seems like they harvest about 1% of their standing volume each year and uh, about 3% of their overall uh, land is harvested. So of course that would mean the, the majority of the harvest are partial harvests. But importantly, at least over the span of the last decade, they have been growing more wood than they've been harvesting. So their stocking levels have actually increased. So the question remains, is this good forestry? Yes, this is good forestry. If you don't think this is good forestry, you probably just don't like the idea of harvesting timber in any situation whatsoever. And that's fine, but that's your bias. So we're just gonna consider this the baseline. But here's the real question I want you to think about. Now, of course, like I said, their microforestry is still exemplary, and I don't want to imply that they're doing a terrible job. Um, but what if they did do a terrible job? What if the small amount of harvesting they were doing was kind of stupid? They didn't really care about forestry in the slightest. They just cut trees. Maybe they would even do really egregious things like cut up right against water bodies. How would that affect the overall forestry? Now, the point I want to make there is that there is a certain level on the lower bounds where your harvesting footprint is so small that it really does not matter. Because, of course, forests in their natural state, they are chaotic systems. You do have wind throw. You do have fires. You do have... Actually, this, this area, I believe, was burned pretty badly in the 1930s. It was a huge forest fire. Um, maybe not this area specifically. I'm not sure the exact uh, area. But there's a lot of, like, intolerant aspens in this general township. Uh, because of that fire. Anyway, there are a lot of fires. There are a lot of insect outbreaks. And so, um, and obviously those things generally don't care about forestry. So what level of harvesting is so small that it doesn't really matter how bad the microforestry is? I'm not saying that that's the situation here. Again, um, it's just something to think about and keep in mind. So let's move on. Okay, so now our next stop, not too far away from the SFMA. Is this good forestry? Again, Yellow is uh, tall trees, blue is short trees, and the areas that are kind of red are no trees, or trees that are so small, they're not being picked up by the LIDAR. At some point in time over the last 20 years, basically every stand of merchantable timber was harvested on this township. Uh, so is this good forestry? I would say that it's probably not even really forestry at all. I would categorize this, to be perfectly honest, more as a real estate grift. And what I mean by that is, uh, and this isn't as common these days because uh, there isn't as much of an arbitrage, but what used to happen quite a bit was that you could buy land and the value of the standing timber was essentially equal to what you paid for it. So you would buy a property uh, with a mortgage or with debt and then you would harvest all the timber and uh, use that to pay off the, the note. So it was essentially free real estate. Now, I don't actually know if that's what happened here. Um, I don't even know who the landowner is, but all I know is what I'm looking at from the data. And the data shows that there is not a whole lot of merchantable timber on this land. And dollars to donuts, uh, it probably was a situation like I described, but I, I don't know for certain. But here's the important question. Is the microforestry good? Well, to be honest with you, we don't really have any reason to think it's bad. I mean, we can see some stands where it looks like there's a lot of standing white pine, which is going to uh, produce a stand that looks something like this. And um, you know, it's, it's going to be mostly softwood because that's just what grows here. A lot of, a lot of you are going to see that and think it was planted or it's a monoculture. 
Um, it is more monocultural, but that's, that's just what the forest grows around here. I mean, we can see they're leaving some uh, buffers of standing timber around the streams, which again, that's main state law. So, you know, good on them. They're following the law. And I'm sure there's plenty of woody debris and some snags um, and a lot of other things that you could point to on a micro level to say that this is good forestry. But again, let's look at the, the macro. This is an aggressively cut stand. And actually we can look over at the border. So this is, I think this is main state land. This isn't Baxter State Park. Down here it is. So here's kind of that corner boundary between this private land and this public land. And we can see the difference in harvesting. So if you're gonna say that this is good macro forestry, I mean, I'd, I'd like to see what you think is bad macro forestry. So those are the two extremes, but now let's look at some intermediate examples. Okay, so what about this right here? Uh, this you could describe as an industrial partial harvesting model. Uh, there is a lot of harvesting going on here, but Again, I mean, there's, first of all, let's just state the obvious. There's way more merchantable timber on this land than in the previous example, clearly. Uh, and we can actually look in some of these harvests and we can see that, yeah, I mean, there's actually really good structural diversity. I'm sure there's a, a very good diversity of species. Actually, hold on a minute. So if we turn on the color infrared, so of course, uh, vegetation reflects infrared better than visible light. Um, so we can see different shades and those shades correspond with different species. So we can see uh, quite a lot of diversity in species, uh, a lot of different types of stands. Um, so yeah, I mean, on the micro level, this is good forestry. And I think if anyone were to look at this on the ground, they would say the same. So what's an obvious objection you can make here? Well, the harvesting is everywhere. The harvesting footprint is very large. It looks like the forest was kind of combed through with these harvesting trails. And so while the microforestry is really good, we might have some problems on the macroforestry. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of land left that's kind of in a mature state. There's not a lot of naturalistic forests left. The forests we do see that are more mature, um, a lot of them are probably some poor quality ground or ground that was harvested a long time ago and is still growing, like maybe right here. And then areas like this, which probably, um, because this, this imagery is a few years old, this may have been harvested already, um, or it's on the plan to be harvested, just based on the patterns here. Oh yeah, look at that. So the CIR underneath is actually, uh, that's funny. Uh, the CIR underneath is a little more recent than the LiDAR data, so you can actually see that, um, uh, yeah, that's funny. So is this good forestry? Well, that's up for you to decide. It's definitely better than the last example, I'll give them that. All right, now this land base is an interesting one. This is what I would call more the Taylorist or maybe like factory model of forestry. Uh, this involves a lot of clear cutting and a lot of planting. So uh, just in terms of the microforestry, they still have a lot of elements that people would think of as, as good, of course. I mean, these, these are, this isn't a real estate grift. This is a serious certified uh, forestry company, but they do, operate on this more monocultural model, if you want to call it, which a lot of you guys would say is bad forestry. But let's look. We have a lot of mature standing forests. That is undeniable. You don't necessarily have the same problem as you did with the last area where every single part of the forest was kind of combed through. Uh, you have some mature areas of forest that are left standing. Um, it does kind of create a patchwork forest, which a lot of people would think is unnatural looking or unesthetic. But if, if we're just concerned about, I don't know, the overall macro diversity of the forests, they're doing something right here. Stream protection, absolutely. Again, that's the law. Uh, do they have retention of some species? Obviously, you have some partial harvesting going on. You have a good diversity of stands. You have um, necessarily because of that, a good diversity of wildlife habitat. Now, of course, some areas are gonna differ a little bit from that. Some areas are gonna be more aggressively cut than others. But I mean, you still have a pretty good amount of diversity and different stand types and so forth. Is this good forestry? Is it bad forestry? I know a lot of you would say it's bad forestry. Um, I understand why, I do. But if we're looking at the microforestry side, which is a single harvest, or really I should say like a single stand, how a single stand is managed over time, I don't think you have a whole lot of ground to stand on. On a macro level, there's a lot you can criticize here, but if we're just looking 
at the micro, I, I, I don't see it, honestly. So I have my own opinions about some of this, um, but that's not really what I wanna talk about. I want you to start thinking in terms of the macro, both uh, when you think about forestry in general, but also when managing your own land, especially if you have a larger forest, start thinking about the entirety of the forest instead of different aspects of a single harvest. Now, speaking personally, the way I would reconcile these two things, the, the difference between micro and macro forestry, and to prevent any sort of confusion or obfuscation around the often confusing nature of discussing macro forestry, uh, because there's, there's several different strategies and regimes you can have within the sphere of macroforestry, whereas I feel like microforestry is a bit more cut and dry most of the time. Um, the way you reconcile this is with the metric of QMD, or quadratic mean DBH, which we're just gonna call your average tree diameter. If a land base is sustaining a decreasing QMD over time, that land base is going to be moving more toward the second example, the one where there's very little standing mature timber. If the QMD is increasing over time, that land base is going to be moving in the direction of the SFMA in Baxter State Park. And under that regime, you're going to see a lot more natural mortality, which is gonna give you, um, you know, those snags and dead standing timber and woody debris that we value for ecological wildlife habitat. Um, and it's going to give you a smaller harvesting footprint, which are going to mitigate any negative effects in, in aggregate of timber harvesting. And of course, if the QMD is stable, then there's at least a stasis between those two states. And, you know, that's good, at least. So there needs to be more discussion around this, more dialogue around these numbers, uh, because there's a lot of SFI and FSC certified companies that have sustained declining QMDs for a very long time. Um, and uh, I, I personally don't think a land base can consider itself sustainable if it has been undergoing a long-term decre decrease in the QMD. What I think happens when we do discuss QMD more, or at least make it um, a more well-known concept, is we're actually holding the forestry community to a higher standard. Uh, there's a reason all throughout the video I kept mentioning that stream protection was just a legal standard because, you know, that's a pretty low bar. And if you read like any, it's funny, if you read any uh, uh, public relations material from any large company, they're always going to talk about water quality protection, water quality protection. Uh, congratulations, that's, that's a law. You, you have to follow it. You have to protect a public resource because um, you don't own the water. Uh, so it's not really something that should be lauded. It's, it's, it really is a bare minimum. Um, and, and so when you're focusing on these micro for, forestry aspects, uh, you are making that bar pretty low and it's pretty easy, uh, to achieve. But what happens if we're focusing on something like QMD, to be honest with you, is the only companies that are actually going to be able to achieve that with enough confidence to actually, you know, post their numbers publicly, um, are those landowners that are serious about, um, their, their, dedication to having an ecologically balanced forest or to, you know, being a good forestry company, something like that, because it does take uh, quite a bit of sacrifice. You are sacrificing economic return to achieve that. And that is something that should be appreciated by the public. That is something that should be, uh, the, the landowner should be proud of. And so we need to better, better be able to identify those landowners. And the way we do that is by identifying the correct metrics. So anyway, let's stop talking about forestry in terms of extremely easily achievable goals, like leaving a few large trees in a harvest and start really having some rigorous standards that only a few landowners are going to be able to meet. Um, I, I think that's just gonna be good for everyone. It's gonna be good for the landowners who actually meet those standards. It's gonna be good for the public who will build more trust in the companies that are saying those things. Um, and uh, trust is something that needs to be built. I mean, that's the most important resource in any, any industry, in any society. Um, so anyway, just something to think about. Um, I don't really have a firm thesis here, but I, I do think this is a useful way to think about forestry. So check out Silvicultural and uh, I'll catch you later.